I started developing games for the Amstrad CPC range of computers using a tape-based CPC-464. Tape-based development was a colossal pain in, shall we say, the neck, just to be polite? Your source code was split over multiple cassettes, one module per cassette, and to assemble the game, you loaded the assembler from tape and ran it. Then you inserted one assembly code cassette at a time, rewound it, played the tape to allow the assembler to pass the source code, and then you went to the next one, the next one, and the next one. And then at the end, you inserted an output tape, rewound it, pressed record, and the assembler wrote the binary to it. And then you could load that tape using the run command and test your latest changes. Now, I think you can see that this was not a quick process. And at the time, there wasn't a floppy drive available for the CPC-464. That would come later. So what could I do to speed it up without paying for an expensive development computer? Pre-internet, pre-Google, I went to the only search engine I had, WH Smith's The News Agents, and I leaped through a copy of Amstrad Action. Now, inside Amstrad Action, I found this advert. And they're advertising Nirvana to me. It was a, an assembler available in a cartridge or a standalone ROM. Now, the cartridge didn't appeal to me as it was fairly obvious from the get-go that I might want to use more ROMs as time went by. So I kept digging through the magazine and I found another advertisement. This one was for a sideways ROM from Honeysoft. Now, obviously, I was getting one of these. Let's just tally up what I was spending my money on. For the ROM box and the ROM itself, that was a tad short of 59 quid. Now, that was a bit of a stretch for me back then. And let's face it, that was almost a third the price of an actual CPC new. However, an instantly available text editor and Z80 assembler, even before I had a floppy drive, that was pro-level stuff. Now, as my needs changed, I added more and more ROMs to the mix. After all, I was running a business and I needed to invoice companies, file my taxes, and write the obligatory complaint letters to Alan Sugar about how late my order of an FD1 floppy drive was. I wrote a few of those. So the ROMs I added to the mix were ProText, which was a word processor, and ProSpell, which was a generic spell checker that was integrated with ProText. Spinning forward to the middle of lockdown one, like a lot of others, I was searching around for things to do, bored out of my mind in the house. And in the attic, I had a CPC 6128 with a broken monitor and liquid drive belts. Now, once I got that machine working, and we're just talking about the disc here, not the monitor, I am not a high voltage person, I started to think, what am I going to do with this? when the expression Rombok floated across my mind and I decided to create my old setup and have a play. So the Rombox I purchased is the Rombo Redux V4. I bought it on Sell My Retro. It cost £40. And while that's a little bit more than the original Honeysoft device, it is an 8-bay beast. It has some interesting additions to it, like the CPC-464 didn't come with a reset key. So the only way to reset it was through the power cycle at the wall socket or yank the power cable in and out of the back of the device. So the addition of a reset switch here is very welcome. The Rombo Redux supports up to eight ROMs, and there's a bank selection jumper that allows you to map your ROMs from either 0 to 7 or 8 to 15. The PCB, as you can see, has detailed silk screens showing what slots the ROMs will be in. That dip switch allows you to specify what ROMs are enabled or disabled, and I currently have all populated ROMs enabled. But there are times when ROMs might clash with one another or when an application is trying to use the small number of memory addresses that these ROMs use that you might need to disable them. Now, the board has a downstream edge connector, so you should be able to daisy chain two of these together for 16 ROMs, although I have not tried this. One thing to bear in mind is you might think you could just remove the ROM box when not needed, but as the vendor warned me, the connector on the ribbon cable has a death-like grip on the CPC-464. And I would be scared of detaching the CPC edge connector pads if I tried it, so I leave it on. So along with the ROM box from the same vendor, I ordered Utopia, Paradox, ProSpell, and ProText. These are all ROMs that I use at various times. Maxam I ordered separately from another supplier, but when they were all socketed, I was in heaven until I noticed, yeah, color me triggered. I mean, you'd think they'd be like an ANSI standard or an ECPA standard for labels on ROMs, but no, not for the important stuff like that just for important stuff like programming languages and safety critical systems. I mean, why do they bother? So a quick look at this image of my ROM box now shows that I do, however, own a label printer. So a problem was solved and trigger mitigated. As I said at the start of this video, my monitor was dead. So if you've got one of these, but you don't have one of those, and you want to use one of these, then that means you're going to want one of these, one of these, one of these, and one of, well, this, this or this. But if you've got all that and connected together, you end up with this. Let's connect the Rombo Redux and power on. 
And here we presented with the following boot screen and a list of installed ROMs. Post our reboot, the ROMs have announced themselves. We have Paradox, Utopia, Prospell, Protext, and Maxim. I mean, also the line basic 1.1 is the system ROM announcing itself too. So let's have a look at just a couple of these ROMs in action. Protext is a modal word processor. If you don't know what a modal processor is, well, it's a word processor that operates in different <clears throat> modes. Now, currently we're in command mode. And if I press escape, we'll go into edit mode. And escape again brings us back to where we were in command mode. If we type help in command mode, we'll get help for the commands that are available. And if we press escape here, we'll go off into edit mode. And if you want help in edit mode, you press control H, which gives you this little help banner at the bottom. And control H will remove it. So you can get more lines of text on the screen if you wish. Now, a lot was made in the manual for ProText about its ability to do search and replace, copy and paste, and things like that. Things that we take for granted these days. But they are, or rather were, quite exciting new features back then. So let's create some text. And keyboard navigation is well supported. As you can see, you can jump around at the beginning and the end of lines. You can move about freely and, and navigate by whole words forward and back. Mind you, keyboard navigation had better be good as there wasn't a mouse to be found. If you look at the top bar, currently we're in insert mode and it supports insert and overwrite. Nothing too exciting there, I guess, but if we pop into command mode, here we can get a word count, which is useful for assignments that have minimum and maximum word counts. And if you notice at the top of the screen, it tells you how much free memory there is. Here we have around 38K of memory available. And considering that ProText is running from ROM, it shows that the app is really only using the lower unbanked 64K of RAM. Now you might ask, how do we format text? Let's say I want to put the word ProText here in bold. I navigate to the start of the word. I press Control X and then B, and it puts a little B in there. And then I navigate to where I want bold to end, and I press Control X and B once more. If I want to put ProSpell into italics, guess what? It's Control X I, and of course, Control X I to get out of that mode. Now, notice this is not one of those trendy what you see is what you get editors. It's more of an old fashioned what you ask for is what you will get. For example, if you forget to terminate one of those bold stretches, it will bleed into the rest of the document. And of course, that means when printing documents out, it sometimes led to unexpected results. Perhaps what you might not expect if you're used to modern operating systems was that the fonts lived in the printer back then, not in the operating system. And this ad for my awesome old RX80 FT shows that it has 128 different type styles, including Pika, Elite, Underline, and Italics, Subscript, and Superscript. Type styles offer scientific and fine print capabilities. But bear in mind, that's not actually 128 fonts. That's a couple of fonts with the permutations and combinations of underline, bold, italic, super, and subscripts, etc. But marketing never changes. It always lies. Let's save this document and save file name of my doc. It's worth noticing that commands from other ROMs can be used here. So let's use the DIR command from AMSDOS. And here we have, as well as another .bass, we have my doc that we just saved. Okay, let's run a spell check, shall we? It's found the word trest, which I want to be test. And the options we have here are S to store that in the dictionary. If it's an actually correctly spelt word that the dictionary doesn't know about. I to ignore that word. C to actually change the spelling manually. L to look up spellings and V to view the context of the word. So if this was a long document and you hit V, it will show you where the mistake is made. So let's do L for lookup. And it's found a few matches, but only matches that contain effectively all of those letters or that are the same length. So it hasn't found test. We can press C to change the word and it shows the context of it. And I'm actually just going to change that to be test and we'll carry on spell checking and then we're done. So if I press escape to go back to command mode, we can save this now. That's a quick whirlwind tour of ProText and ProSpell. Again, the most important thing about it being it instantly loaded. Let's move on to Maxam, the reason I bought the ROM box. This is the main menu for the app. Apart from accessing the meat of the app in the text editor screen, you can disassemble and list memory, and that's both to the screen and to the printer. You can edit memory directly, search in memory, move blocks of memory around, compare memory, and run external commands using that pipe syntax as we did when listing files. One interesting point about Maxim is that while you can disassemble ROMs, it will not allow you to disassemble Maxim itself. Hey, sneaky copyright protection. Let's hit L to list memory and I'll list from 1200 hex and list up to 1230 hex. And there's a reason for that that we'll see later. But there is the content of memory at that address and it has the string hello moto in it. Let's go to the text editor, which is really the IDE part of the system. And I'm going to load a here's one I made earlier file. So let's use 
X to run an external command in DIR to see what's on there. And the file that I created is called print.asm. And I'm just going to load that. Press E to enter the editor. Now, I'm not going to go over this in any great detail, but it's just a program I shoved together to demonstrate Maxim. And all it does is print a message to the screen using a ROM routine print char. Don't worry, there is no need to understand this, and it'll be over soon if you get scared. So the line org1200 sets the starting location of the program in hex. Now you can see why we listed 1200 hex before when we were looking at the list memory command as it contained the results of the previous assembler run. We load HL with the address of the string to print. And that's the aforementioned hello modo. Just to bear in mind, this is a Pascal style string. So the first byte contains the count of characters to print. Then we call print string. And all that does is read the count of characters, then moves the point of the first character to print. And then it prints each character out, increments the pointer to the next character, decreases the number of characters left to print, and then loops until all characters are output. Before we can run it, we need to assemble it. So we go back to the main screen there, press A to assemble. And as you can see, each assembly line is output with the machine code bytes for each Z8 instruction shown before it. Errors will be shown by the line causing the error. Now, maximum error messages, while good for the day, could be a little cryptic, shall we say. Cryptic, but usable. But we have no errors and no warnings. Uh, it's as if I've done this all in advance, really, isn't it? We can execute our code if I hit J and then select 1200 as our start address, and it prints out the line, hello motor. Now, that's a very quick tour around the functionality of Maxim and covers just a fraction of the capabilities of it, but one that hopefully gives you a flavor of what this is all about. And yes, I was missing a red statement in that code. I know that. We'll have a quick look here at the Utopia ROM. And Utopia was a collection of fairly random extensions for Amstrad's Locomotive Basic. It also had some handy dandy general purpose utilities that are of broader use. So Utopia has a handy command called help that lists the available ROMs on the machine, the slot they're installed into, and their software version numbers. Versioning of ROMs was interesting as there was no update mechanism available other than perhaps returning your ROM to the vendor if the vendor was willing to update it and send you a new one. Now, the only way of knowing if there was an update available though was spotting an advert for a new version. The help command takes a slot number as a parameter and lists the commands in that ROM. So let's get the help command for slot five, and that's Utopia itself. There's clearly a lot of commands. These were divided into two groups, commands that provide new functionality and commands that wrap existing AMSDOS functionality and expand them. As an example of a wrapper command, let's look at ERA. Without Utopia, the command is pipe ERA, comma, the file name in quotes, which can be a bit of a faff. In Utopia, if you just type pipe ERA, the ROM will then prompt you for the file name. No quotes needed. So a little bit less hassle. You hit enter to delete the file or escape to cancel. Let's have a quick look to see if we have a file to delete here. And yes, we do we have this test.bass file. And there it is gone. So that's the wrapper functionality. For the new commands that it added, we have things like ROM on and ROM off. These allow you to enable and disable ROMs in software if they clash. And let's have a look at one of the power commands that's in Utopia, which is dedit or disk editor. Let's look at drive A, track zero, sector zero. Now, what we're doing here is editing the raw bytes on the disk, which I don't think I have to tell you is an incredibly risky process. So I'm going to nope out of there because let's face it, I'm a board certified coward. And we could have a quick look at disk test. This tests the integrity of disks. And it's interesting to note that in Amstrad land back then, disk was spelt with a C, not a K. Now we're going to check drive A and all is good. I'm going to park Utopia there as most of it was basic and that isn't a topic for this video. Final ROM, Parados. Now, Parados was an extension to AMSDOS, which was the Amstrad Disk operating system. And it offered formats for three inch disks that went up to 203K per disk versus the standard 178. You might sneer at that extra bit, but that was significant back then. Parados supported external three and a half inch double sided floppies that could store up to 800K a disk. Parados also has a raw disk edit format that allows you to modify disk content in a similar manner to Utopia's disk edit command, but operating on Parados's extended format. I'm not really doing justice to Parados here as it really was a power user's tool, but I don't have any external drives to show you it working on. So where did I get this stuff from? I bought the Rumbo Redux V4 from sellmyretro.com. There's a link in the description to that. The seller was the user, the equalizer. And I, I can't say enough good things about this guy. He answered all my questions quickly and accurately. The box is made to order, I think, and it arrived very promptly. He also supplies ROMs. They were, when I last looked, about four pound a piece. So what did my little experiment cost? 
well, that's about seventy pounds. And to be honest, it was well worth the money because it did soak up a lot of the dark days of the lockdown. So I achieved my goal of recreating my setup from 1985, and I had a blast playing around with these ROM images and reminiscing. Modern day pricing was cheaper, though <clears throat> I'm not sure of the authenticity of the ROMs. And you know, ROMs are great. They extend the capabilities of your Amstrad computer with instantly accessible functionality. But if I'm looking for downsides to ROMs, I can only think of two. I mean, sometimes they didn't play well together. And that's why you've got those dip switches. And if you bought them at a certain version number, updating them wasn't easy or even possible. But I think part of the allure of ROMs was that they were fairly niche. And those of us that used them felt like we were power users. And we're all snobs at heart, aren't we? Aren't we? But that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon.